So I'd like to introduce Darwin Shaw, Jean Shaw, and Leatrice Johnson. Well, as you can see, we're, we've been having a little trouble getting our act together this morning. <laughs> but um, uh, we're going to try to skirt around some of the uh, stories where Renee is very much involved and and uh, go into some other stories, uh, hoping that she will get here but if, in time. But if she doesn't, then we'll go into those. What's first on the list there, Leatrice? Well, when you were speaking last night, mm -hmm. uh, you left some things out for me to fill in. Yes. So I, I want to continue just a short version of the 34 when we met uh, Baba in the, uh, the hotel. And uh, after he greeted us and walked off, we went off to one side and we met this little lady who, with whom we were going to spend the night. <coughs> and then I was curious to know where Bala had gone, whether it had gone upstairs or not. And uh, we were standing in a little group and I, I felt a, a feeling like you have when you know somebody's staring at you and your back sort of, you know, somebody's looking at you. And so I slowly turned and there was Baba by the elevator and as I was turning, Baba was turning and went like this. And I quickly turned back because I thought I was caught in the air. And, but I, irresistible feeling came over me to do it again. Did he go upstairs and I, as I'm turning? He's turning again, <laughs> and, the, and he did the same thing the third time. And, and then he went upstairs to the, uh, his rooms, and uh, as Darwin said, we had uh, been in a lobby, and then Elizabeth came down and brought us up. And when we were up there and, and in the room waiting for our call, the call, I was... Um, coming in, uh, ladies first, you know, <laughs> and as I came in, <clears throat> I didn't see anyone in the room. <clears throat> I didn't see, I only saw Baba like floating in the air. He had his white robe on, and, and Sandra and his hair down, and I didn't see Nariman, I didn't see the bed, I didn't see the furniture. I don't know how I got on the side there, and Baba uh, had me sit there, and he gave me an embrace this way, and, and then uh, that one on my left, and then, and then this little lady, you know, uh, got a hold of him and was cooing and gooing over him, and I, I wanted to do the same, and then she was taking up all that. I couldn't hold back, I was all pent up, and, and there was such a charge sitting so close to Baba that I began to well up with it sobbed way from the pit of my stomach, and and I was just about to go <laughs> like that, you know. I said, "Oh, I wish I, I hope I don't spoil this beautiful moment." And Baba immediately disengaged himself so gently, and and came over and put his, you know, and reached over and put his hand on my wrist, and I just calmed down like a lovely little lake, you know, and just sat there quite serene. And while Baba was, Nariman um, was speaking, Chanji. I didn't, Chanji, and I never, I never missed Baba not talking. And uh, I, it was the same as if Baba was saying it. And then uh, after it was over, and Baba embraced us, and, and uh, we were to see him, we had the joy of looking forward to that. And when I came out of the room, <laughs> the flood came, and I just, Wept and wept and wept and wept and and Countess Tolstoy was uh, outside the room there and she just took me, gathered me to her bosom. She was sort of bosomy, uh, Russian lady, you know, Dutch uh, Countess, and she just took me to her room and someone was calling her and she just went like that. She took me and she cradled me and she petted me. Of course, I was young and small and. The teacher, and she could have, could have had me on her lap the way she was uh, consoling me. And I don't know where Darwin was, but it took a long time 
before I was able to <laughs> show my an appearance again, and I was very happy and cheerful and we and so i I'll, I'll just leave it there to <laughs> so we get any comments on uh, the next day at Stokes or the no you you fill the bill fill that in pretty <laughs> well. you want to shift <laughs> shift over to fifty two then yeah. Uh, what, what do you have on your list there? Well, the next time that uh, Baba came to the United States was in 1952. And then my brother met Baba in April of 1952 by himself. But then all five of us met Baba together in, in the lagoon cabin in Myrtle Beach on May 10th in 1952. So that was the first time for my sister Renee and me to meet Baba, and we were in the family setting. And now I don't know whether to go. Well, let me just, uh, since you mentioned our son, let me just interject that part. Um, see, Baba uh, had arrived uh, earlier in April, and he required two weeks of seclusion at the center before having anyone come, and. Uh, uh, we were at home in Schenectady, New York, and one day the phone rang, and this voice, a very cultured voice with an Indian accent, uh, addressed me, uh, and I, right away I realized this was Mani. <laughs> of course, I never met her. And she said that Baba would like to have Lowell come down and do night duty. Our son's name is Lowell. And that he should come right away. Of course, he was in school, and it presented a problem, it was toward the end of the semester, it presented a problem of getting him out of school and <laughs> getting him back in and time for his exams and all of that. Uh, of course, we didn't know what Baba had up his sleeve, but everything worked out all right and Lowell took a train and the uh, anticipation of seeing and being with Baba was so great that he didn't, wasn't able to rest at all on the way down. It was a 13 hour more than that, more than a 12 or 13 hour trip out of New York City, plus about four hours from our house to New York. And then someone, uh, he, he had to go to Florence and someone had to meet him there and so it was another two hours. So he was pretty well tired and it was morning when he finally got to the center and uh, Frank Eaton was caretaker at the time and, and he had gone after him at Florence and he brought him to the caretaker's cabin and uh, Lowell felt that he should shave as quickly as possible. So he was over there in the corner shaving and, uh, you know, trying not to be nervous about meeting Baba. And he heard the screen door open to his right, but he assumed that was Frank. And then a hand was laid on his shoulder just like this. And he turned around and looked right into the eyes of Baba. <laughs> <laughs> See, Baba knew that he would be very nervous, and uh, this was his way of uh, allaying that nervousness. And of course, this was his first physical meeting with Baba. And uh, somehow Lowell got through the day all right, although he was very tired and didn't get much rest. And that night he was supposed to do night duty for Baba, and he was at Baba's house all alone with Baba. and. Uh, Baba showed him the bell where he, or buzzer he would push if he needed him to find out what time it was or for some water or whatever he might need. And uh, Lowell understood all these things. But then Baba pointed to the bedroom out at his and told Lowell he should lie down and relax. And Lowell said, no, I, I'll, I'll fall asleep and I won't hear you. <laughs> but, but Baba see, insisted that he lie down. And sure enough, he fell asleep, and he slept right through. <laughs> Didn't hear the buzzer at all, all night long. <laughs> and <laughs> so the next morning, uh, Baba let him sleep, you know. I was very patient with him. But this was sort of unique, a unique thing for someone like that. With Baba's mandali there and all of that, they weren't in the house, and just low. And... Uh, so, uh, of course, Lowell didn't realize how much of an impact Baba's presence was making on him. <clears throat> and uh, so in 
So we stayed through, actually, just through the following day. And uh, then he was to return home. Apparently, this is what Baba wanted. And he returned home an entirely different person. He uh, had, his voice was deep and resonant. His eyes were, were very powerful. And his radiation was so great that we, it could be felt throughout the entire city. And I don't know how far beyond, di different ones remarked that they could sense this radiation, Baba's radiation, his presence. So perhaps this was the main reason, you know, Baba wanted him to come down so that he would uh, be become a, a medium for his extended presence, you see. So that was sort of a, a very wonderful incident. Prepare us. Yes. Because <coughs> we were ready to go for the uh, trip down. That was my <coughs> car, yes. Because that was in April and then he left in May. <coughs> And for Renee and I, you can imagine how extremely curious we were. <laughs> and we could feel the, this love radiation from him, and that was a preparation for us as well. But I remember saying to my brother, what does he look like? And I went through every picture in the house and made him <laughs> tell me which picture Baba most resembled. And he said, well, he doesn't look like any of those pictures, really. <laughs> And, and that did help Renee and I to, to uh, feel more of what it would be like to meet Baba. But when it, then to continue, part of that story is that uh, after we had met Baba, was that the next day or the day after that Baba had our family into the, into the car with him and Adi driving, took us over to his house and showed us all around his house, like the grand host, and showed us room for room. And then he showed us where Lowell slept, and he, then he took us out to the hallway and showed us where the buzzer was. And then he pressed that buzzer, and he said, see, and he didn't wake up. <laughs> he just kept on. <laughs> so he told on Lowell. <laughs> he told us the whole story. <laughs> And Lowell was there too. Was Lowell was with us. But incidentally, on the way up, riding in that car, Gene has a little story too, sitting in back of Baba and seeing his. Oh, yeah. Ring. I was in back in the station wagon and. Back of Baba. Yeah. And back of Baba. Suddenly I was aware that Baba's head was so big and his ears were so big, I was like Red Riding Hood. <laughs> Baba, you got these big ears. Baba, you had big head. Never thinking that. Baba knows all your thoughts. And he never let on. So Baba, after that, used to tease me in a subtle way. Baba was always so subtle. Whenever he'd go by, uh, like one time I was by the kitchen at the center, and he came over, and he's always doing this, you know. And he started walking away, and he got bigger and bigger and bigger. I said, how could it be? He's farther. And, and he's so big, and I, I dismissed it. And uh, then I was in the guest house with the women, Mandalay, and uh, Baba came. That was in I 1952. Yeah, 52. Uh, well, I'm trying to say about how Baba is a big teaser. <laughs> and uh, so um, he came in suddenly. I didn't know it was Baba. I was standing up, and I looked, and I suddenly was aware that it was Baba, and I said, Baba said, my height, how could that be? Right, eye level. I said, Baba looked so big and tall, and of course, you know, was uh, uh, very uh, <laughs> puzzling. So others have said the same thing, and I remember uh, Bunty Kelly said something about that. So Baba had a habit of doing that. And there were times when Baba had a picture taken with a bunch of children, and, and he looked so small sitting there. Another time, Darwin said in 54, he was among the men, and he saw, took a picture of Baba there, and he said, Baba looks so small there. I, I wonder if it would come out in the picture. Well, I said, nobody's going to believe this. I looked over and saw Baba, and I took a second look, and I, I was, uh, you know, amazed. I said, nobody's going to see this, and I'm sure it won't come out in the pictures, but it did. In the book, The Beloved, you will see him sitting with the Western men, and he's very, very tiny. He forgets to put his molecules together the same way every day. <laughs>
But there was one more little incident in that <laughs> station wagon ride. You, you felt so free with Baba that you started to talk to him oh, in a southern in accent. southern accent. I found myself talking, oh, Baba, look at the ocean, so calm the today. Lake. The lake's so calm today, or something like that. And Baba looked tickled, and then he said to Darwin, you, you, you say the same, and he couldn't think of it. You know, and he was pretty I good was at imitating. At <laughs> he couldn't say it. So they were having a comedy in the front seat there. Yeah. We were in the back seat listening. Renee and Lowell and I were in the back listening. Yeah, there were three. There were three. You and you. Wait. Adi, Adi was. In the very Adi was I see. Jean and I were next, and then. That's right. Okay. I remember uh, Adi was driving so fast, and Bubba was and poking and making yeah, him drive poop, faster, faster, faster and faster. faster. Yeah, those trees I, I, there. You, wow. oh, the trees and the road is going this way now. Wait, faster, faster, faster. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why they were, we weren't in any hurry. <laughs> don't follow that example. <laughs> <laughs> Especially there. Yeah. Well, now go back. We... Well, to go back, um, when we, Renee and I first met Baba was with the family, and we entered the lagoon cabin, and Mother entered first, and Baba stood and embraced her. I was right behind her, and I had had, a, still I had some, anxiety about meeting Baba. Not about him, but about me. <laughs> My ego was pretty much in evidence. And I was afraid that I wouldn't um, feel Baba's love. And I didn't want to miss the opportunity of feeling Baba's love and, and really making the most of being with him. So when I did have my chance and, and Baba embraced me, I just my mind stopped thinking about all those things, and I just felt at last I'd come home. And that's all I needed to feel at that instant. And Baba, uh, as he embraced us, he, he, you had the impression that he was so happy that he had the chance to embrace us. And that, like a parent who embraces the child who has come home. So, do you want to oh. do the minute you see a story about her dream she and how oh, 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 she will? Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, well, we all sat down, and there was a little couch, and we sat on the on the side here, and Baba sat over at that end, and Adi was interpreting. And Baba said, God in heaven is happy that you have come. You know, that's really very startling that God is happy. And so we, we started feeling more and more happy. The, the happiness started coming up and it, uh, we didn't burst out into tears, but it started uh, mushrooming up to the point where we were, for me anyway, and I think Renee too, we were choking the tears down. And pretty soon my throat wasn't sore, but the muscles got tight, you know, and I was trying not to bawl and trying to absorb everything that was happening. And in the meantime, uh, I had a pad, and I was, can you imagine this, taking things down in shorthand? <laughs> but we didn't want to miss anything, and we felt it was very important to take notes to, so that we could have our record of what Baba said to us. And we do have some of those notes and, uh, of the first interview and the second interview. And after that, I began to think, I, you know, you can write shorthand very automatically, but even at that, you're missing some of the moment. And I think that Baba allowed us to do it that way because Baba's, the intensity of being with Baba was as much as we could take. So having to do the shorthand was just right. Uh, the rest of it is lost to posterity, thanks to our uh, wanting to have the moment with Baba. But we, we all have... <coughs> marriage was marriage taking notes. Uh, I don't remember anything that. Baba said. Yeah. 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 <coughs> so, um, in, in this happiness, we, we felt Baba's love, and at the same time, just looking at him, he was so beautiful, he could appear um, as though you had a, 
uh, you ran the gamut of what you saw in Baba. In a flash, you ran the gamut of seeing his, his God in human form and yet his humanness that felt as natural as, as your dearest friend or your, your closest relative. And it, it's, a, it's such an opposite. All at once, he combined all the opposites in this simple, sweet, innocent, calm, and, and love flow. It, it's incredible uh, that you cannot grasp in just being with him. You know that you can't grasp it all. So you just say, all right, I, I know that I can't. And you let it, you stop um, trying to assess the situation with your mind because you know it, it, that's not going to help you. So you go for what is going to help you, and that is just being yourself in the, in, in the core of yourself, because that's what Baba is reaching, the core. And I felt that Baba was seeing himself in me, and I recognized myself in him, not my little self, but that self, that reflection of his self. And that's what makes you very happy when you suddenly get that mirror of who you are and who you are meant to be. So that's how it started, only all those words were not in my mind then. They come back to you later on through the years because you, you just cannot assimilate it all. Baba wouldn't let you be in awe of him. I know I was very at home with Baba, just like I would be with him a very beloved father, and he was always that way with me. I never saw him any other way, it, like a gentle father and, and very indulgent, <laughs> with when, a lot of hugs and kisses. When Baba stood up to embrace us, you could feel that he was as soft as rose petals, mm -hmm. and yet he wasn't crushable or, or breakable, but there was a tremendous strength that wasn't overpowering. But most of all, it was this sweet, soft, delicateness about his body and his form. Yes, and Baba's love. And his hands were so soft that one time when I sneaked a kiss on his hand, he was like kissing a silk glove. It was so gentle. A little thought occurred to me too that, you know, uh, as a parent, I suppose I had been interjecting myself more, the, more so than I should because uh, uh, in this gathering, uh, the first family gathering with Baba, Baba began asking the Beatrice and Renee and Lowell person, you know, questions and I started answering for them, you know. <laughs> and Baba reached over and just, you know, hold it, bud. <laughs> Let them answer for themselves. <laughs> And, but he had placed his hand like that. I didn't feel any strength in it. But when we got out of the side of the cabin, I looked at my arm, and there was like a burn there. It wasn't, it didn't, wasn't sore or anything like that, but it had left a mark, curiously. Remember that? I mean, for you to always let them speak their piece. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> was it at that Baba said, they belong to me? To say he's in and charge. That he's in charge. But then it wasn't for years that I realized that while it appeared that the statement was said in the family context, contents that we belong to Baba, later on I began to see the obvious that we belong to him as souls in every sense of the word, and that if we belong to him, it, and he takes the trouble to say that then he is in charge of everything about us. And if he says that we belong to him, he's saying it to everyone. At least that's the way I see it. And the same. At different times when we were with him, not just our family, but at large groups, you know, like this. He would say, you are all my near relatives. Everyone. Everyone belongs to him. Yes. I've noticed this all through my experiences with Baba, that, uh, and also in India especially, 
that uh, one wasn't treated like a guest in the sense that there was a division between uh, yourself and, uh, and Baba and his mandali and so forth. You were treated like family. And uh, Baba made us always feel that we were genuinely and really a part of his family. The feeling was there, the sincerity and the acceptance, which was really a big thing because unconsciously we have a tendency to, to be shy and feel that we should be in the background a bit, you know, but uh, in a very subtle, gentle and beautiful way, he made us realize that we were totally accepted. There, there were no, there were never any questions of uh, qualifications or anything else. I'm gonna wander a little bit here. It reminds me of a little story that uh, one time a friend, uh, an Indian man who was a Baba lover, wanted to bring a friend. And he started to enumerate his qualifications. And Baba listened for a second or two and he held up his hand. He said, the only qualification that I'm interested in is in his love. And so Baba never, never was judgmental and uh, we never felt any pressure or any penetrating uh, analysis of us or anything of that sort. We, we felt we were loved and accepted totally, complete acceptance. I had a, a similar experience along that line in the barn in 1956 or 58? 58. In 1958, um, all of us who were, there were maybe some 200 people who gathered every morning at the barn from nine o'clock to <coughs> nearly noon. We spent the whole morning with Baba at the barn. And we had a way of walking from the main center to the barn, um, walking as fast as we could so that we could get a close seat to Baba. And on this particular day, my father and I were sitting next to each other, fairly close to ba uh, toward the front. And I forget all the other things that were taking place during the morning because the highlight of it for me was that the begin the begin was being played, the record uh, of that tune. And as we were listening to the words and just absorbing Baba's love and being there with him, and Baba was, as always, pouring his love out and smiling always. Um, all of a sudden, when the words came to, and darling, I love you, Baba's eyes flashed to me. And, I, you know, I, I was so startled that out of all these people, he looked at me, and I was so completely touched that he, he bothered himself to convey to me in that subtle way, spelled out, and darling, I love you. I, would, I couldn't believe it. And later, uh, I guess maybe years later, we were later. This, we, reviewing, you know, and uh, I, she was keeping that to herself. And curiously enough, I was keeping the same thing to myself. <laughs> because I felt he looked directly at me. And we therefore inferred that probably everyone there had the same experience. <laughs> if you notice in the movies uh, of Baba, Baba's eyes are, move gracefully as they flash. They move very, very quickly. And they, they dart like that. And within a fraction of a second, he could have covered 200 people. And his impact could have been. Well, they seem to rest long enough so that you got the full benefit of that meaningful phrase, darling, I love you. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of a family that Baba would always call into the lagoon, the five shaws, or he didn't have to say anything, he just put his hand out like that and then the five shaws. Uh, we, we were really, when we were around Baba, we were such separate individuals. 
Baba treated us so separately. I hardly saw Darwin at all at the center, or hardly saw the children. Everybody had, you know, something to do, and we hardly ever got together, <laughs> except when Baba called us in. And. Uh, hmm? Well, I was, I was going to tell. Thought, I was yes. going to tell something funny. Well, please do. <laughs> um, there was a gentleman that used to be called in with us to the lagoon cabin, and Obama wanted the five of us, but he would also ask for him. And I said, "Why does Obama always call him? Uh, he was a friend of ours, but why? Why but with us? You know, every time he called us, and and then um, it, it was in '52, and and." We had such a wonderful day with Baba, and then we went back to our apartment in town. No one stayed at the, I, I shouldn't say no one, but I mean uh, most of the people didn't, only those that were serving and helping uh, women mildly. And uh, so he came there uh, that night, and we to were, our to our, and we were uh, reminiscing about the day. And uh, then he put his finger up, and he had a habit of doing that, some of you will know what I mean. And uh, he would be, especially to the women, uh, you know, he would be telling them. He was older than they were, and he'd be, you know, chiding them about something. And uh, then he said, and Eugene, he says, you shouldn't be telling j jokes tell him, uh, to Baba and wasting his time. And I don't even know that I had told a joke. And, but, of course, uh, it amused Baba whatever I said. I don't know what I said. And I said to myself, I wasn't a bit disturbed. I said, Bob is hearing you, Bob is hearing you. <laughs> and, but I was, but I forgot about it. And then the next day, Bob calls us and again, and this and gentleman. And then, what does Bob do? He spends 15 minutes with us telling jokes to us. <laughs> and then he turns to him and he says, Baba, likes jokes <laughs> and humor. <laughs> and he never pointed at any lady after that or at me. <laughs> Little person, things like that. This person. It was a very loving person. Baba loved him very much. Yeah, very close he, he, to Baba. Very close. <laughs> well, we might go to New York, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, when uh, Baba was uh, going to give interviews at the Delmonico Hotel in '56, everyone was gathering, and of course uh, we always pitched in and helped. We didn't have to be told somehow intuitively we knew what needed to be done, and I was helping to arrange the room where Baba would sit, and flowers were coming in, and, and I, I placed them in the right places, and, and then I. Uh, and I said, oh, Baba can't sit in that street chair like that. What, what are they thinking of? And I, I said, uh, Harry Farshaw, of course, his wife, uh, Marion, was uh, doing all the uh, trip arrangement across the country, so he was uh, one of those you could approach uh, for help. And I said, Harry, why don't, do you suppose you can find a chase along somewhere in a hotel uh, among the guests? Go find one. I think you can. <laughs> and, he did. He actually found a chase lounge. And I said, oh, is anyone here that could go quickly home and get a spread for it? I don't want Baba here on that couch, somebody's couch. And, um, oh, yes, uh, Anna Karish uh, immediately she said, jumped up to the, uh, and grabbed the opportunity. She said, I live very close. And she quickly took a taxi and went and got it. And I said, and bring your cloth for this table here. And she got one that her mother made, and it was brand new, and, and I spread it on the table. And I said, and bring some gardenias from us girls, <laughs> our, our daughters and myself and her. So there, Baba had nice gardenias. And I said, will somebody bring some fruit? Baba always likes fruit. He likes to give prasad. So there it was all arranged. You can see it in the movies or in slides. And Baba, in um, this chase lounge, we got a nice picture of him like that. I should have brought it along, and uh, Baba was very pleased. And of course, we never bothered about whether we were going to have an interview. We were just the uh, workers, so to speak. So, but we saw a great deal of Baba. And before Baba came to the uh, room, 
I, everything quiet down, everything was ready and, and people were waiting. They had their appointments and, and I was sitting among the others uh, in the reception room. And I jumped up like a jack-in-a-box and ran to the hall. And then my mind said, what are you doing? Where are you going? And, and there, Baba was coming down the elevator and the door opened. Jean, by marriage, he said, and gives me a parcel. It's as if Baba said to me while I was sitting in a reception room, hey, Jean, come on up and meet me at the elevator. And I did and didn't even realize Baba used to do that to me. I responded. And I didn't know what I, why I did it. And so he handed me this parcel, and it was Baba's uh, uh, coat and sadra, and he wanted me to launder it and to press it and to bring it first thing in the morning. I had quite a task in a hotel in a small bowl, you know, to wash his clothes and to press them. And luckily I had a travel iron and... Uh, I borrowed everybody's towels and squeezed out the water and hung them up with everything and pressed it in the morning. And then I would bring it to his room and that gave me an opportunity to see him before he went downstairs to see everybody else. And Darwin was, we were going to our hotel, we were in a hotel nearby. And well, I, excuse me, I always yeah, he liked tell, to tell this little incident under the caption, we were ever loved by a coat. <laughs> Jean was carrying this package, and it was Baba's pink coat and sa white sandra. Suddenly I realized, hey, she's carrying Baba's pink coat and jacket. So very gallantly I offered to carry it. <laughs> and uh, surprisingly she parted with it and let me carry it. And the moment I got it under my arm, it was just like carrying Baba. It was, it was just so filled with love and love radiation that was just enveloping us just from that coat. Imagine, just as hope, I know many of you have discovered this for yourselves from his jackets and various things in India there in Baba's room, but uh, that was a, a, one of my first big and very pleasant surprises. When I was laundering these things, I think half of the water was my tears. <laughs> I think I washed away all my bass and scarabs, maybe not of this life. But <laughs> what you were going to tell about? At the same about. time in, in the Delmonico Hotel when Baba was staying there, one day he had many groups of people in to see him. And on this particular day, after the groups left, he, he motioned for the Shaw family to stay put and not to leave. And it was lunchtime, and we stayed with Baba, not thinking about lunch, because we were so happy to have an extra few minutes with Baba. And Baba just sat in a chair, and we just naturally uh, found ourselves sitting in a circle on floor around him in a group. Baba, please, he told us how to where sit. To sit. I was sitting right next to Baba, and then we were in a complete circle. We had no idea what he had in mind. And, uh, and then we were quietly sitting there, and then we knew after a while what was, what was going on. Baba was just feeding us with his love, and we all felt the same later when we discussed it. It, it was, uh, I talked to Don later, did, did you feel that oneness? I, I experienced what oneness is. Uh, how we, you can feel oneness with a group with more than, you know, just like one-on-one. -on -one. And it was so beautiful, and they all felt it that way. And I don't know how long it lasted. It was so beautiful, and of course, tearful and so on. And then when Baba was about to dismiss us, he uh, asked for the box of chocolates that were there. Of course, when I came in, I noticed those chocolates, you know. <laughs> <laughs> and so Baba gave us a chocolate, and that was our lunch. And we were satisfied. We had so much soul food. And then the chocolate on top of that, <laughs> we were very, <laughs> we were fed very well and very happy. Can you hear now better? Out How there. Is this better? For Jean? For Jean or for me? For me. Can you hear now? How, how is this? Okay. Um, to 
uh, when speaking about the oneness, you see, Baba didn't explain what he was going to do with us. He knew that we would know. And it was a surprise to us to experience this oneness in Baba's love. It's as though our personalities just completely were wiped out, faded out of the picture. And we do have very individual personalities. We don't agree on everything and that sort of thing. But our, the feeling of oneness is a complete unity. It's a calm and it's a collected force in giving to Baba. We were all united in giving our total love to Baba and he was continuously pouring that love to us. It was without reservation. He was pouring as much as we could possibly uh, hold. And in order to hold that, have a container large enough to hold all he was giving us, we had to empty ourselves out from the depths of our being. Not consciously. But not consciously. It was just a natural rhythm, a natural flow. And it was a breathing as well, as Baba was breathing his love into us. And Baba said, when people are hungry, they go out to eat and they're satisfied. But Baba's food is, is their love and Baba is satisfied. That's his food. And he also said, and I am, he also said, I am very happy with your love. <clears throat> but one of the points of having different points of view is that each one can explain how they felt. And uh, my impressions were, uh, first let me explain that we weren't especially privileged because sometimes it would be another family or another group or individuals so that everyone had their times with Baba just like we had. <clears throat> But it was, it came always as a very delightful surprise. And on this occasion, Baba's suite of rooms was filled with people. And uh, Baba wasn't going to give us a discourse, but just to allow us to be there and, and uh, enjoy the presence of his, uh, with his love. And uh, we were all going to file out the same as the others, because when Baba's ready to have you go, he has a little sign, which is, you know, it's time to go. And uh, so as we were filing out, Erich called to us softly, Darwin, Jean, your children, Baba wants you to stay. So we looked, raised our eyebrows and said, wow. <laughs> and we came back and then Baba motioned where we should sit cross-legged in front of him like that. I think I was in the chair. No, no, you were no. sitting on the carpet. I don't know. Yes. I don't remember. And one thing about it, when we talked together, we didn't remind each other of little points that we've missed, you know. So, uh, Baba said there was no need for us to, to talk. And as, as usual around Baba, already we were at a greater depth than words or intellect could reach because love was flowing. And as so often happened, our heart centers were opened up by Baba's love and we were enabled through his love to love him as you would want to love him in your wildest dreams. We were able to not only lose ourselves in his love, but we were actually adoring him. And he allowed this and there was an exchange uh, which was just beyond beauty even. I found myself enveloped in light and like the others, the uh, sense of being completely one, we lost all sense of individuality in that sense of separation. Uh, we remained separate in the sense of who we were, but uh, we, there was a sense of unity, complete unity. And uh, well, this, this was just my, I'm sorry that Renee and Lola aren't here to give their version of it too. This was one of many similar experiences that we had with Mama. The point uh, I would add about the same incident is that in ordinary life sometimes we feel very limited about not having enough time, especially for an experience like that, although we weren't conscious of being limited by time at that moment. Instead, time didn't exist. 
we had an eternity with Baba during those timeless moments. So we had our fill regardless of time. We, we didn't, didn't even give a thought to it, getting lunch after that. No, we never got lunch. <laughs> we had Baba's lunch. <laughs> he said that. He said, this is my food, and this is my feast. I'm feasting, and this is my lunch. He said, Darwin is a jewel. Incidents or are we? We have other family we have other family incidences, but one was the tea that we had with Baba in uh, the Holiday Lodge in nineteen fifty eight in San Francisco. Fifty six, excuse me. Uh, before we had tea with Baba, my father and I just uh, seemed to meet as we were crossing the courtyard at the Holiday Lodge. And it wasn't our usual practice to have tea. And we just said, well, let's have a cup of tea. And we went to the adjoining restaurant, and we were having our tea, innocently enough. And uh, we got this call, Baba wants the Shaw family. So we rushed out right away and joined the rest of our family and went to Baba's room. And we were greeted by Baba most warmly and, and happily as the and we're seated on the couch, and Baba was at the end of the room in a chair, and he was appeared to be so happy to have us with him, as, as well as we were so happy to be with him again. And we sat down very comfortably, and to our delight, Erich was serving us tea, and Baba was our host. And my father and I felt that was very amusing. <laughs> we wondered if Baba knew he, what other tea we were having. <laughs> Only this tea with Baba was quite different because it was the nectar of his love. And it was his special company and his, with his presence. And he sat there holding his cup and sipping his tea with us while we were looking at each other. And we were just completely absorbed in his company and in his presence and in this wonderful experience. And we felt very natural and at home. And after a while, I began to think, my mind started going, and I said, nobody's talking. You know, sometimes in such social occasions, you say, who's talking? <laughs> and all of a sudden, Baba said, we don't need to talk. And then he looked at all of us, and he said, they live only for me. And this was an occasion where then the conversation rolled on, to other subjects, and the rest of the family were rolling on with a conversation, and I did too. But what happened to me in a flash, when Baba said, they live only for me, all time stood still, because Baba was in his own way again, very subtly, but very effectively, reminding me and confirming to me a dream that he had given to me way back in 1952. And in, during that time, I was having um, an experience of working at my first job and coping with uh, the material world and trying to lead a spiritual life and doing all that I thought Baba would want me to do in this kind of situation. And one, I was trying to also to be happy. So I was, what I was winding up doing was just telling myself I was happy. That was the best I could do, as a kind of mental gymnastics. Well, Baba came to me in this dream, and he said, how is it upstairs? Which means, what's going on? And I said, um, I can live with myself, but I would like it better. And I thought that was a very good answer. And Baba looked at me, and he said, what you should have said is, I cannot live without you. Uh, I must live only for you. And that's quite different from what I had given him. I woke up immediately and wrote the words down. And from that time on, I focused on living what Baba told me because I wanted to live what he wanted me to do. And I realized too 
that I couldn't live without him. And that feeling of not being able to live without him created a tremendous energy which forced me to find him within in order to rely on his help, which in turn I found to be unfailing. So it was he who put me into this position of being able to live only for him, and he gave me the force to be able to do it, and he gave me the incidences in my life to be able to do it, be conscious of living for him. And all the while, during these years, I wasn't really that sure that I was accomplishing all of this, even though I was trying. So it was a tremendous thing for me to feel this um, joy and happiness that Baba would trouble himself to give me this confirmation that he knew all about the dream and that indeed I was living for him, only for him. So that was my secret story that the rest of the family didn't know about for years. And it shows how Baba works on many levels. You have all these people in the room and no one else knows. And we don't know, that's why we get together and compare notes about what was happening to you during that same time. Mm-hmm. <laughs> while, while you're thinking about it, let me tell you a little funny thing. Baba always had a little funny thing going with John Bass. And whenever Baba wanted a cup of tea, he would you know, put a bland expression on his face and say, John says he wants a cup of tea. John would look surprised. <laughs> He'd always blame it on John. <laughs> Does any of the audience have a burning question that they'd like to ask? No? Did um, Baba ever ask any of you what, what you were thinking, right on the spot like that? Yes. Do you want to tell them? It goes with one of my other talks. <laughs> <laughs> That's I not fair. I <laughs> no, I do. Okay. It's, it's really a beautiful thing that happens. Yeah. Anybody, do either of you There's want to some say? hands on oh, here now. Hand? Okay. Okay, the question is to Leatrice how Jean and Darwin talked about uh, Baba to her when she was a little girl. Oh. Yeah, I, we just exposed them to Baba like you would to yeah. measles, you know, and they caught it. <laughs> 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 we we caught the disease <laughs> by osmosis. Baba's pictures were all around the house, and my parents never sat us down and said, now we're going to talk to you about Baba. I have no recollection of anything of that kind. My memories were that I had a one-to-one relationship to Baba on my own, and that was from looking at Baba's pictures. I felt the contact. And I accepted Baba as God, as a mental idea at that point. And I wanted to love Baba, and I wanted to know more about Baba. I had a tremendous curiosity to know about Baba. And so it was really, I felt that it was I who was asking them the questions about Baba, rather than they coming to me and saying, now I'm going to tell you about Baba. And another thing was, they had meetings, Baba meetings, and there weren't Baba songs as such then. The Baba songs were the old Christian hymns. And my father played the organ. And they'd gather around in the evening while we ch- little children were being put to bed. And I'd listen to those songs. Take care of you. <laughs> and that was my meeting. And that, was, that met, whetted my appetite all the more uh, to, to, to want to know more about Baba. And... Uh, so th- it wasn't so much that, but as I g- got into maybe the years of nine or ten, I remember this long conversation about reincarnation and karma and asking them every question in the book about it. And I was very interested in knowing all the ins and outs of that particular subject. And so they were available to answer all kinds of questions, and, and maybe they 
maneuvered a, us into a position during the conversation to want to ask more. I don't know about that, but for, and we we went to various Christian churches as well, so we had a background to compare Baba to other forms, uh, to his Jesus form. But we pretty much, I felt, came to Baba in our own individual way, in our own individual seeking. But being in a Baba family definitely uh, is, um, well, for me, how could I say, would I have come to Baba without that? I don't know. It would have been much more difficult, but it was very natural for all of us to, to love Baba because of being in one family. God will take care of one of the hammocks. In the, in, in the garden, and the Jesus garden. loves me. Jesus loves me. <laughs> All, they were put, uh, fell asleep to those songs. We had them about the time they were supposed to be in bed, and, and it was right next door, and they heard them all. Also, we met Narina when we were children. Mm. And I felt Baba's love first through Narina when I was about eight or nine years old. Some, sometimes, uh, for me anyway, you, you are so mixed up with your parental love that someone outside the family comes along and it's, wow, you, you know the difference and you know that it's Baba's love from, and then you can recognize, we moved along from furniture to furniture, um, in Yupan Dunes when we lived there for that year. Also, when the orders came for the 40 days fast or whatever length of time it was or the other orders that we as small children were not allowed to participate in the long silence that Darwin told you about, we weren't allowed to participate in it per se, but as a background we were participating. We could answer the phone and do little things. and We felt that we were doing something for Baba in a way and helping them to obey. But actually, another point was that I didn't become conscious for many years that I first started to obey Baba when I was seven. When, um, and this is part of being in the family. When my father had the order not to um, touch women over the age of seven. And I was all too happy to play my part in it and not just as I was we would exuberantly rush up to our daddy and hug him when he came home from work. And I had to remember not to do that. And I felt that Baba, I was, I was doing this for Baba. Are there any other questions? Jean, the question was, when you mentioned the gardenias and the tablecloth, were the gardenias just special to you, or is there a story behind that to do with Baba? And um, we had, um, this was in 56, I guess, but in 52... Uh, oh, don't shut it up. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I said that to you as a child. Well. Talk on uh, tomorrow, I believe, yeah. in the morning. <laughs> so you'll have to I'm come saving. back, hopefully. <laughs> um. <laughs> okay, what's that, Jack? Okay, the question is Did any of you ever see Baba angry? No, I never saw him any way except loving and sweet and kind and devo uh, doting Father. Well, I, I think this goes with one of my <laughs> talks, too. But, <laughs> but Are you just still a little of the means? Yeah, well, once or twice I annoyed Baba very much. <laughs> uh, well, okay. One time, <laughs> one, one time it was in 1952, <clears throat> after giving, Baba gave three days of interviews at the home or apartment of Ivy Deuce in New York City. <clears throat> and the following day, uh, John Bass and I were with him in Scarsdale, which is where he was staying, about 35 miles north of New York City. And we were out on the patio with Baba. It was very pleasant there. And uh, Baba had given a uh, brief message uh, the, the previous day for all the Sufis and others who were there. 
and uh, he wanted this brought out so it could be gone over and, and uh, perhaps improved grammatically. And uh, so we were going over this, making suggestions, you know, and, and there was a table and Baba, we were sitting around the table. And, and um, <clears throat> then this was interrupted by uh, Rano uh, coming out of the door and she had to report to Baba about something that he had uh, told her to do. And Adi was there too, and uh, so she gave her report, and it wasn't a satisfactory report. And Baba was very displeased with her, and uh, the mood changed quickly, and lightning began to flash. And, uh, <laughs> you know, and uh, Rano just stood back against the wall there, you know, like a soldier. And I was beside her, and, uh, <clears throat> you know, I thought, what, what do we do now, you know? And uh, then I guess almost unconsciously, as if to try to break the mood, I said, uh, well... Excuse me, wasn't something transpired before that, that the men had been raiding about the trains in America? Well, that's a different story. <laughs> 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 so uh, then in order to uh, sort of unconsciously... Uh, uh, to hope to break the mood and get back, I, I kind of bent over the table and I said, uh, well, you know this phrase here, Baba, you know, looking at the paper. And Baba looked up at me sternly, and Irich reading the board and said, my dear Darwin. <laughs> so I, I stood back beside Rano, uh, <laughs> and I looked sideways at her and I said, now we're in the same boat. <laughs> and Baba looked up at us sternly and said, not quite. <laughs> okay, we have about 15 more minutes. Uh, Tim, and then I'll get back. The question is, a long one, <laughs> um, about feeling Baba's love and other times not feeling Baba's love. Yeah, and now that he's not in the, in the body, is there a difference? And do you have any advice? Any of you? I'm trying to make him my constant companion. <laughs> and uh, in fact, uh, the more, and I have my uh, problems with health and uh, I think it's for the purpose of making me say, ouch, Baba, help, help, help. And I'm always turning to him all the time. I don't know what I'd do if I didn't have that uh, to, to do. And of course, it always helps because then I know he's with me. As he said, I am always with you. And so I remember that phrase. Huh? And Baba says he's always, and he knows, and if he wants to take it away, he, he would. And, but but he also said, if you're 100%, uh, I think I, I can't quote the whole thing, 100% uh, disheartened. I can't even read it with these glasses. Can you, can you read it? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's the same one I have. <laughs> Do not be disheartened, alarmed, when adversity, calamity, and misfortune pour in upon you. Thank God, for he has thereby given you the opportunity of acquiring forbearance and fortitude. Those who have acquired the power of bearing with the adversities can easily enter the spiritual path. Trust God completely, and he will solve all your difficulties. Faithfully leave all to him, and he will reveal himself as you love, as, as, your, as you love. Wait, how does that go there? Your heart must be... 
Your heart must love, so so even your mind is not aware of it, as you love God wholeheartedly and honestly, sacrificing all at the altar of His supreme love. You will re- realize the beloved within you. Yes, I, uh, actually, um, I have a talk here this afternoon on ways of uh, cultivating the inner life, and that will cover that question. And if I don't answer it specifically, bring it up again. For, for me, I'll answer that since I don't have another talk. <laughs> Um, I feel Baba's presence more than ever, that he is with us now and more so than ever, and that we have to do our part to keep him with us. And like everyone else, I have my ups and downs, and times when I feel his presence so sweetly and so wonderfully, the same as being with him. And there are times when I say, where are you? And I feel that during those times when I have to say, where are you, I've been looking somewhere else. And then it, I feel that Baba okays a little bit of that because he wants you to feel the pain of separation. The point is to be able to feel that pain of separation. It, it can become so acute that you'll do anything to, to become close to him, and that's exactly where he wants you. He wants you to feel that pain, because that forces you to give more of yourself away, to make more room for him. And also I find that I like very explicit I- messages like this, and I find that Baba gives those to me when I feel the need. And they're very startling and right on. I am aware that I have been uh, trying and struggling. Suddenly I'll, uh, just without thinking, I will go to a bookcase or among my other things, and without even trying to find something, my hand comes on to some book or, or paper that I've saved, and wow, it hits me right <laughs> in the head to, to remind me, you know, to bring me up to... Uh, to what I should be thinking about instead of thinking about my problem. I should think of Bob and what he has to say. And it really is just what I needed to hear. It's just like a direct message from him. This, if you allow me to read one more, this is one of my messages he gave to me that I came across. Let me tell you this fact. This is from Baba. It's a general thing. It was in the unstruck music, actually. Let me tell you this fact. There is nothing to worry about, nothing to be disheartened about. We are all, each of us, meant to be happy. Our life is by God's grace, and happiness is that which makes us feel that we are one with God. Know know that all else is illusion. It seems pretty obvious that Renee isn't going to make it, so maybe we should tell, tell a little bit more about... Uh, well, someone had a question there on old. <laughs> Some of the things that happened in 52 at the, where the interview, when Bob asked you if you would... Hmm? Yes, why don't you launch forth on that one? All right, we were saving this particular little story for Renee's input on it. But since she's not here, we'll go ahead so you won't miss on out on it altogether. And that was um, back in 1952 in the lagoon cabin when we both first met Baba. And after our wonderful greeting and feeling so happy, and Renee has her particular story about her first meeting with Baba that I won't tell. But this incident is addressed to both of us because Baba looked at both of us And he said, will you do anything I tell you to do? And we said, yes, Baba. And uh, Baba said, is that yes or just yes? And for me, I was thinking for the first yes, well, 
I'll say yes, and I know I will, but I'll think later about just how difficult it might be. But I will do it. So then when he said, is that yes, or just yes, we said yes, and then he said, would you jump in the lake? Yes, Baba. Of course, I knew I could swim. <laughs> then he said, with the alligators and the snakes? And I said, yes, Baba. And I was thinking, well, all right, if he wants me to die in the jaws of an alligator, that's what he wants. And Baba makes it easy for you to commit yourself to obeying him. Because you, you see his love, and you feel his love, and you feel the completeness of his love. So we, we both affirmed, yes, Baba. And Baba said, I'm very happy that you will both do exactly as I tell you to do without hesitation. And then he turned to my father and he said, isn't that right, Darwin? They will do, they will both do exactly as I tell them to do without hesitation. It was though he was firmly implanting that whole feeling of obeying Baba without hesitation, instantly obeying, to be ready to commit ourselves to obeying Baba without thinking. You see, I thought on the first yes. And he said, I'm very happy that you will obey me. And he said, if you knew that I, was in, that I am in everyone and in everything, then you would have no fear of anything. He actually took you to the lake, didn't he? Well, that's, that's part of Renee's story. I, that wasn't my story. Later on, he did have Renee lead him to Gator Pond, where, where the big gators are said to hang out. And, and he had Renee go ahead, you know. And in telling the story, uh, Renee always says that she had her go ahead so she could break the cobwebs and all that going through the woods. But um, when they got there, there might have been several big gators. They're there now. I mean, uh, it's, you can go over that to that little pond. Now they have a little gazebo there, and you can see them almost any day. But on that particular day, there wasn't a gator in sight. <laughs> so uh, Elizabeth came along, too. And Baba looked at Elizabeth and said, where are the gators? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, this sort of confused Elizabeth. She said, well, Baba, they're, they're generally here. <laughs> but the point was that, that he was, Renee didn't know what he was going to lead her into, you know, leading her over where the gators were. He might have said, go ahead and jump in, you know. <laughs> I think uh, we still have a question. I think is it uh, back there? Baba, any time during those years that we knew him from 34 to 52 when we had no physical contact. But we thought, well, if we're going to trust Baba, we know that Baba knows everything and we're not going to bother him. If he wants to contact us, he will. And we, we didn't. We didn't bother him. So sometimes when he didn't hear from us, and from time to time, he would send us, uh, and, and like Darwin said last night about what he had to do and what we had to do. He would send a cable and say, Oh, my dear Shaws, then we had to write <laughs> to him. <laughs> Baba wrote three letters to my brother and sister and me during those years, 1945, 1946. And in one of those letters, he said that I will be coming soon, and soon seemed to be forever, to wait till 1952. And then when we were uh, later on, uh, closer to 1952, Baba wrote each, asked each of us to write a letter to him, stating what we were studying in school and what our interests were in school. And he replied. Yeah. Uh, gave us uh, explicit advice, or did we ask for it? Ex we got our advice from Baba's discourses. Uh, um, when they were out, that was later. 
Yeah, that was months later. Yeah, I think, well, time, oh. Marvel Skill wants to add something. <laughs> The question was about the spot on uh, Darwin's arm and how long it lasted. Only a couple of days it faded, you know, like almost like a, a little sunburn <laughs> faded away within a couple of days. Oh. It wasn't painful at all. That, it was a curious thing, you know. <laughs> okay, well, I'd like to thank all the Shahs for coming. <laughs>